Attacking media freedom in the Philippines, President Rodrigo Duterte takes legal action to shut down the largest TV network, which is also his fierce critic. Journalists accuse him of dictatorship. So what now for freedom of speech in one of Asia's largest democracies? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. It's being described as the most severe attack on media freedom in the Philippines. President Rodrigo Duterte has filed a Supreme Court petition to shut down the largest television network, accusing ABS-CBN of committing what are described as highly abusive practices. The National Union of Journalists of the Philippines protested on Friday, accusing the Duterte government of trying to silence critical media. Duterte has repeatedly vowed to stop the network's operations. Its franchise expires on March 30th. Nicola Gage has our report. Journalists and activists show their support at the headquarters of ABS-CBN in Manila. The leading network in the Philippines faces closure after nearly 70 years. President Rodrigo Duterte's government says the broadcaster violated its licence by charging viewers for content and allowing foreign investors to own part of the company. But supporters believe the reason is revenge. It's another attempt to really uh, muzzle uh, the press. Every time somebody criticizes him, even in the calm, most calm, you know, most logical manner, his comeback is always with rage. Duterte says the network refused to play his campaign adverts during the 2016 election and it's broadcast highly critical reports of the president's crackdown on illegal drug gangs. Rights groups say police have killed at least 27,000 people over the past three years. The government says the total is 6,000. Rappler is another media outlet facing shutdown for speaking against Duterte. The news website's lawyers are contesting several court cases, including tax evasion and illegal foreign ownership. Speaking exclusively to the listening post on Al Jazeera, Rappler's founder says Duterte's government is repeating previous tactics. You go back to the 1970s and then you go back again to 1986. Anytime someone wants to take control of government, the first step is to control the media. This is the 21st century version of that. But what's so interesting is you don't even have to declare martial law to try to control media. You, ha you hang a Damocles sword over owners, their families. Uh, you threaten them with legal cases and you can control them this way. ABS-CBN's licence expires next month. The government says it can continue to broadcast while Congress decides whether to renew its franchise for another 25 years. Activists say whatever happens, Duterte's shutdown attempt has caused long-term damage to media freedom in the Philippines. Nicola Gage for Inside Story. Well, let's bring in our guests now for today's Inside Story. From Manila is Harry Roque, a lawyer and former spokesman for President Duterte and a former member of Congress. In San Diego, California, in the U.S., Richard Haydarian, a political scientist and author of The Rise of Duterte, a Populist Revolt Against Elite Democracy. And also in Manila, Danilo Arao, journalism professor at the University of the Philippines. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us on Inside Story. Harry Roque in Manila, let me start with you. You were President Duterte's uh, spokesman once. You've known him for a long time. What is his government's real motivation in wanting to shut down ABS-CBN? Well, let me first correct your reporting. No? The president has clarified through his current spokesperson that he has nothing to do with the quo warranto petition filed by the Office of the Solicitor General. Under the Philippine Constitution, the Philippine Supreme Court has original jurisdiction over these kinds of petition. And under Rule 66 of the Revised Rules of Court, the OSG is in fact authorized to file these petitions. Now, having said that, I don't think the petition will prosper anyway. It is in the nature of a prior restraint. And in our jurisprudence, 
um, all prior restraints come to court with a heavy presumption of unconstitutionality. So uh, short of a clear and present danger, I don't think the Supreme Court will act on the petition, especially since the life of the franchise of ABS-CBN um, is only until March 30. My fearless prediction is that the court will not act on it until the franchise of ABS-CBN expires, in which, in which case it becomes moot and academic and not ripe for judicial determination. All right, let me bring in Danilo Arau in Manila. You don't seem to agree with Harry Danilo when he says that this petition has nothing to do with President Duterte, that President Duterte had nothing to do with the petition. Yeah, it has every, everything to do with Duterte because we just need to realize that uh, as early as 2017, uh, in his second State of the Nation address, uh, he identified uh, three news media organizations, including ABS-CBN, uh, for either the critical reportage that uh, they provide to the public, as well as uh, allegations of foreign ownership. And besides, uh, the Office of the Solicitor General acts in behalf of the government, and we cannot deny the fact that Duterte is the head of the executive department, even if there is clear control also of the legislature and the judicial branches of government. So Jose Calida, who is currently the Philippines uh, Solicitor General, uh, would definitely uh, be receiving uh, marching orders uh, mm. so from Malacanang. Does the president then, are you saying that the president calls the shots when it comes to media regulation? Of course he does, uh, because he's the president, number one. And of course, uh, second of all, uh, he has a lot to gain uh, from the closure, uh, if ever, uh, of ABS-CBN. Uh, it's not just simply a vendetta. Uh, he already uh, stated uh, publicly that uh, he would prefer that uh, the Lopezes, uh, who currently own uh, ABS-CBN, would just simply sell uh, ABS-CBN and that uh, things will be fine. Mm. And at, and at on another occasion, uh, he was even quoted as saying that uh, for as long as ABS-CBN will support federalism, uh, which is one of the uh, thrusts uh, of the Duterte administration, uh, he is willing to forgive uh, ABS-CBN for whatever alleged transgressions. So, of course, in the court of law, Harry may say that these are just circumstantial evidence, that these are irrelevant, but in the court of public opinion and in the struggle for media freedom, uh, all of these things mean a lot. And uh, we see right now the convergence toward the probable denial of the request for the renewal of franchise of ABS-CBN. All right. Richard Hedarian, your thoughts on this? I think uh, just too much imagination in that okay. comment. I think the president has gone on record <laughs> that um, he leaves it to Congress whether or not to renew the um, franchise of uh, ABS-CBN and under a constitution that is, in fact, a sole exclusive prerogative of the House of Representatives. And then he makes a big issue about the concept of doctrine of qualified political agency. In this instance, the president has expressly said that he had nothing to do with that petition. And under the rules of court, Rule 66, there would be dereliction of duty on the part of the Solicitor General if, in his belief, there is a violation of the franchise and he does nothing about it. Okay. So let's not automatically conclude that any act of a cabinet is the act of the president because the qualified political agency says exactly that. It's qualified until ratified or rejected by the president. And in this instance, the president has said, I had nothing to do with that. Okay, Richard Hedarian, let me the bring same. you into the conversation. Right. Gentlemen, let's just allow Richard to also give his thoughts on, on this issue. Richard, uh, Harry says the president has nothing to do with this petition. Uh, our, our guest, uh, uh, Danilo, in the Philippines says, no, he does, and he's being vengeful. What, where do you stand on this? What do you think is going on here? Well, as a political scientist, my job is to compare different countries, especially fledgling democracies over time. And I think it would be quite naive and fanciful to assume that uh, in countries like the Philippines, which is a fledgling democracy, you have a complete and absolute rule of law. I think it's very dif difficult to separate the exercise of law uh, from political interest in countries like the Philippines. So this is something that it will be very hard to deny. Uh, at the same time, of course, we know that any kind of attack or move against uh, media like ABS-CBN is not the first time that it's happening. Even on, after the collapse of the Marcos dictatorship, we had other presidents, Philippines, like President Estrada and other populists, and at some point, popular president, who was also very critical of the ABS-CBN. And I think the GMA administration also in the past was quite critical of the ABS-CBN. So President Duterte is not the first president in recent memory in the Philippines who has gone against ABS-CBN or at least accused ABS-CBN of having certain bias against it. So in some ways, 
as shocking as this is, this is also not surprising. So the other thing we have to keep in mind is President Duterte is also very unique for his decisive character. This is a person who has effectively ended the Philippines' alliance with the United States, which has been there for 100 years by abrogating unilaterally and perfunctorily uh, the Visiting Forces Agreement. So with that kind of president, in that kind of context, I think to talk about absolute rule of law is a bit fanciful. What we should talk about is rule by law, whereby sometimes the law is actually a reflection of the interests of who occupies the throne. Mm. President Duterte has had a particularly I'm sorry, uh, tense I don't agree relations. that we are a fledging democracy. I don't think we agree. I agree that we have a fledging democracy. We gave people power not only to the Middle East, but to the rest of the world. And not only that, our jurisprudence in free speech and in the freedom of the press is very well established. Regardless of who the leader is, that jurisprudence remains. And that is why my fearless prediction is that OSG can file it, but it is subject to a heavy... Excuse me, I'm still speaking. Good manners. I waited for you to, uh, okay. to finish your statement. But um, I think the, the, the present, the rule of law in the Philippines will prevail. And even if the sergeant filed it, as I said, my prediction is because it is in the nature of prior restraint, it will not pr uh, prosper. But uh, let me just ask you, Harry. I mean, the government, as our, uh, Danilo and Richard both said, have used the same accusation about foreign uh, ownership against uh, the news website Rappler. Uh, which in 2018 had its license revoked, and that decision is under appeal now. When you look at the things that have been happening over the last few years, over the last three years that President Rodrigo Duterte has been in power, it doesn't really show um, a, a positive image. I mean, the media seems to be under pressure in the Philippines. How, how do you explain this? Well, don't be confused, because the case of ABS-CBN is different from Rappler. In the first place, the ABS-CBN's... Uh, um, depository instrument was approved by the SEC and Rappler's was not. And the reason being, in the case of Rappler, the Philippine SEC said that um, Rappler gave foreigners control, particularly on the issue of whether or not to continue with the business, which is tantamount to control and therefore violative of the Philippine Constitution saying that uh, media business can only own by uh, Filipino citizens. And that is why, again, my fearless prediction is, although this was used as a ground by the Office of the Solicitor General, it will not prosper, precisely because the, the same administrative agency that ruled that Rappler violated the Constitution approved the issuance of this depository instrument and therefore um, carries with it the burden of proof of regularity or the fact that the administrative body who is most authorized and most competent in these matters have said that there, is no there is, was no violation of the Constitution. All right, so you seem to say that due process will be followed by Congress and the Supreme Court. Uh, Danilo Arau, do you agree with that? Do you think uh, the, the Supreme Court justices will indeed follow due process in this case of ABS-CBN? Well, we have to ask ourselves uh, who controls the Supreme Court right now. Of course, people may say, like Harry, that it's a wild imagination. But whether or not uh, the case will prosper, it is still a form of harassment and intimidation against the media. That's the bottom line. Uh, Maria Ressa mentions the sword of Damocles uh, hanging over our heads. And the culture of impunity is really there. We need to remember that what is happening to Rappler, ABS-CBN, uh, and even the Philippine Daily Inquirer, uh, this present a chilling effect on the other news media organizations, and it's quite reminiscent of martial law. Uh, because during martial law, it's not as if all media organizations were harassed and intimidated. Only the so-called alternative media or mosquito press were uh, subjected uh, to various forms of censorship. But uh, history would show that uh, the dictatorship uh, really suppressed the media. So you don't, in other words, you don't need to harass all the media. You just need to make a, some, an example out of a handful of them. And one of them is ABS-CBN right now. Mm -hmm. And there are dangerous pronouncements being made by Duterte's allies, particularly House, House Speaker Alan Peter Cayetano, whenever he says that even GMA and uh, TV5 would be investigated because they allegedly also have uh, PDRs or Philippine depository receipts. Okay. And again, we need to fact check all of these things because even the Philippine Stock Exchange defines uh, PDRs as not being tantamount to ownership and that these are just simply investment instruments. Uh, but the twisting of the facts as well as the framing okay. uh, by the government uh, would claim uh, otherwise. And Richard that's why people are up in arms, including uh, journalists and media workers. That would partly explain why every Friday we're always at ABS-CBN uh, 
uh, grounds uh, but to make when you say when you say uh, people are up in arms let me just ask you this I mean most polls have shown that the president's policies are very popular with Filipinos his war on drugs remain popular with Filipinos and he's urged the public not to believe the media so is he winning this ba battle of public opinion when it comes to the media okay as far as the surveys are concerned uh, we need to look at it uh, quite uh, Secondly, because it's true that uh, he enjoys popular support, but that was that has been the case uh, whenever uh, terms uh, are just uh, during the first half. Uh, because of, in the Philippines, the term of office is six years. Uh, it's within the first three years, of course, you still enjoy relatively high popularity. And besides, uh, when we look at uh, the trend, uh, insofar as authoritarian regimes are concerned, definitely they enjoy... Uh, popularity at the start. Uh, mm -hmm. Even Adolf Hitler had uh, more than 90% uh, popularity rating uh, during the first few years of the Third Reich. So it's not as if uh, this is something new. Okay, and Richard, one of the things let me ask, let me bring in Richard. I, I get sorry, your point. I think that's a Rich stretch, no? Okay. I think that's a stretch. Marcos, Harry, I don't stand think, by. had the I'll same kind of popularity as President Harry, Duterte. Harry, stand by. I'll come to you in just a minute. Okay. Let me just bring in Richard uh, back to the conversation. Richard, Duterte has been president for three years now in the Philippines. Where does this case and the others uh, against the media leave freedom of speech in the Philippines? Is it headed towards an even, uh, you know, more dangerous path? Well, I mean, first of all, I think we have to give due credit to the Times. I mean, you finally have a ruling or a verdict on the Maguindano massacre, which has been lingering there for quite some time, almost a decade. So there are some positive developments there. And let's not forget one of the reasons why the Philippines was considered as one of the most dangerous places for journalists in the past was because of the Maguindano massacre uh, a decade ago. So we have a ruling on that. Uh, second, um, yes, there are concerns about chilling effect on the media, but you know, as someone who has been in a wide range of countries from North Korea to China, parts of the Middle East, and also in the West, I could say that the Philippines overall, if you look at the editorial line of major newspapers and ma major media networks, often that I work with, uh, I don't see any sign of editorial censorship mm. by, by the bigger ones, the more prominent ones. In fact, you could see more critical statements about, uh, about President Duterte's quite prominently across the Philippine media. So while I think there are concerns that the Philippines is uh, going in the wrong direction or that there could be a chilling effect, uh, as far as the editorial line of major newspapers concerns, I still do not see that. But that doesn't mean that we should not worry about it. anything. President Duterte is popular. He's still the commander in chief. He has a very strong support. And I think we should also not forget uh, not only in the mainstream media, but also in social media and alternative media, how the supporters of the president are very aggressive, very assertive, and they're, you know, at least uh, uh, they're fierce that, you know, the attack on mainstream media or personalities from mainstream media is not confined only to the court of law, but could extend also to the alternative media. So we're talking about a much more hybrid, much more liquid, and I think gray zone uh, situation rather than black and white dictatorship versus full democracy situation. All right. Harry, your your thoughts now. You had uh, quite a few things you wanted to add uh, to what uh, Richard and, and Danilo have been saying. Go ahead, please. Well, I was one of those who uh, prosecuted successfully the killers of 30 journalists in the Maguindalao massacre. I think that proves that we have a working legal system. It's not perfect. It took 10 years to convict. It should have taken uh, a shorter period of time. I've been working with... Um, uh, journalists and uh, media players um, for my entire career, 29 years of uh, practice as a media lawyer. And I can tell you that as it stands, the jurisprudence in the Philippines recognizes completely freedom of the press. Governments may try to suppress it, but the courts will never um, uphold any infringement on freedom of the press. I think we have one of the best um, jurisprudence on freedom of the press. We have lent this to the entire um, world community. We have used Philippine jurisprudence in the, in the UN Committee on Human Rights um, to um, um, assist journalists in trouble in Vietnam, in Malaysia, in, in Thailand. And um, the international community has been accepting Philippine jurisprudence. I think we will survive any attempts to suppress freedom of uh, the press precisely because of our rule of law and our jurisprudence upholding the supremacy of freedom of expression and freedom of the press. Danilo uh, Arayo, you're a journalism professor. Your response to that? Yeah, of course, uh, on paper, we have laws uh, protecting uh, freedom of speech and other basic freedoms. But of course, there's freedom of speech and there's freedom after speech. 
uh, freedom after speech is a different matter altogether uh, because we we may have we may be the free freest press in Asia or one of the freest in Asia, but we're one of the most dangerous places in the world to practice journalism. Make no mistake about it, a number of journalists killed from 1986 up to the present. 1986 was supposed to be the time when democracy was restored with the ouster of the Marcos says then uh, in the Philippines, uh, we have, depending on the statistics, uh, the Center for Media Freedom and Responsibility pegs it at, if I'm not mistaken, around 164. The National Union of Journalists pegs it at around 185. But regardless of the number, the statistics are quite alarming. While it's true that the Ampatuan massacre case is quite historic and it's, it, it should be considered as a landmark case, what we have here still is a partial victory. And besides, the decision is a consolidated partial decision. Uh, 80 or I think four had been uh, apprehended, so around 76 are still at large. And uh, this, and we still need to monitor the case because uh, it, uh, there's a possibility that uh, the guilty verdict might be appealed to the higher court. So it's still a long drawn out battle. Uh, while we have to be happy with the victory, with the Ampatuan massacre, mm -hmm. we still cannot ignore the fact that killings are happening and that various forms of harassment and intimidation are also happening. Just recently, one of my friends, the executive director of Eastern Vista, was, uh, was arrested. She's a journalist, but she's accused of being a high-ranking member of the Communist Party, which is quite baseless because I can vouch for her, uh, you know, legal personality. Right. But these things are happening right now. Okay. Richard Heydarian, let's just come back to the ABS-CBN uh, case, CBN case. Which side do you think the Supreme mm -hmm. Court will side with this, in this case? And, you know, will they be due process, in your opinion? Well, the way I would rather put it is this. I mean, I think comparing President Duterte to the likes of Hitler would be a, a step too much. But uh, I, I like to compare him rather to people, populist authoritarians like Raja Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey, or even some pe people like Putin in his earlier years. I think the president and his supporters have done a very effective job, including on social media, to the partisans of the administration, uh, that... When you talk about mainstream media or independent media, they're not necessarily independent media, but instead they're more a reflection of the interest of the old oligarchy that has been in control of the country. I think that kind of rhetoric has been very effective for President Duterte. And as a populist, he positioned himself as an anti-establishment. And you, you can see uh, the sentiments on the ground, you can see the sentiments on social media, the, the backlash against a uh, perceived or real move against ABS-CBN or other media uh, outlets is not as huge as anyone would have expected. I mean, let's not forget ABS-CBN is a huge conglomerate that is not only composed of news production, mm -hmm. but also huge entertainment. Right. But we don't see that because right. I think many people in the Philippines believe that the president is not going against freedom of expression per se, but going against liberal oligarchs who are trying to put uh, blocks right. or blockages for his agenda of transforming okay. the country. I think that's yeah. something to keep in mind. And the Supreme Court is not necessarily above the fray. Again, in pledging democracies like in the Philippines, they'll also take this broader political context into consideration. Okay, Harry Rock, I'll give you the last word. I mean, uh, there are thousands of people whose jobs are on the line, are threatened if this license, uh, the ABS, uh, CBN's franchise is not renewed. You know, how, how will the government deal with the fallout? Well, I think we need to distinguish between the petition for co warranto and the franchise. Mm -hmm. no? As far as the petition for co warranto is concerned, I think the jurisprudence is established that where um, an act of government has the effect of prior restraint, then it is presumed unconstitutional. And for this reason, I think the petition will fail. Okay. However, because broadcast is covered by a franchise, it is a privilege because it is using airwaves owned by the state. It is not as, uh, as, as free as the other medium of mass media. In fact, uh, different courts in different jurisdictions have said that those which are um, entitled to full protection are the um, print media and the internet. And in the Philippines, the jurisprudence is that broadcast uh, media, in fact, is subject to the most control because, unfortunately, it is still subject as a prerequisite for the exercise of freedom of um, the press. The fact that they need a privilege to use the uh, airwaves in the form of a franchise. My fearless prediction is Congress eventually will give them a franchise and the president as a lawyer will respect that.
Thank you very much, gentlemen, for a very lively and interesting discussion. Harry Rogue, Danilo Arau, and Richard Haydarian. Thank you for joining us on Inside Story. And thank you for watching. As always, you can watch this program again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can, of course, also join the conversation on Twitter. A handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fully Batibo, and the whole team, thank you for watching. Bye for now.